Greetings, my name is Ron Sabi, president of the Minnehaha County Historical Society, and I welcome you to our history talk tonight, sponsored by Core Trust Bank. Tonight's presentation is going to be something of interest to all of us, is gonna be the Remembrance on the Pomp Room, presented by Will Prines. And I bring to your attention that the Historical Society has different ways that you can do your charitable giving. Uh, first of all, a donation to the uh, Historical Society for general budgeting purposes would be greatly appreciated. We're working on our 2021 budget, and believe me, things are really tight, especially with the coronavirus it has uh, impacted our budget. But you can also sponsor a history talk and newsletter. That's one way of helping us out for the year. Another way is to look at the historical marker program. The flood of a couple of years ago has really impacted a couple of our markers, so we have some repairs, and actually one of the markers, I believe, is in the bottom of the Sioux River, so we are in the process of replacing that. So we, that is what our historical society is about, are the markers. There's over 200 markers throughout Minnehaha County. So the marker program would be a good way to put your donation dollars to use. And we also have the State Theater. Everybody's excited and it's, it's exciting to see that the State Theater is a part of our theater going in Sioux Falls. However, the restoration of the State Theater was basically for the building itself and the contents. Our, we have a uh, board of director member, Diane Olson, who has taken an interest in the artifacts and there is no money budgeted for the artifacts. And so we were working with the State Theater to restore the artifacts like the billboards and things like that. So if you are interested in donating to the State Theater, this is another opportunity. When you make your donations, please note where you want that donation to go to. Because if we just get a check saying this is a donation, we assume that is to the Historical Society's budget. I also want to give you an update on the Tuthill House. I'm sure that a lot of people are aware of the demolition plans for the Tuthill House. We were contacted by a committee in regards to the Tuthill House back in November. The board decided to have a resolution presented to the Parks Department asking for a year's moratorium on the destruction of the building. And the board voted it down. However, the issue was brought to the City Council and the City Council has decided to give a 90-day moratorium towards the uh, uh, demolition of the Tudhill House. So the estimate is between $200,000 and $250,000 to restore the Tudhill House. If you are interested in donating to the Tudhill House, I encourage you to give that consideration in your charitable giving in the next couple of months. We don't have all the details yet, but as soon as I get the details, I certainly will be able to pass that on to you. If you are interested in donations to the Tuthill House, send us a email expressing your interest and we will keep you in mind and keep you posted. Send it to info at minnehahahistory.org. The next history talk is going to be presented by Jim Carlson, our past president, and this is on the Spanish flu of 1919. This is going to be a very timely topic and this is sponsored by FYI. Tonight's program is presented by Will Prines on the Remembrance of the Pomp Room sponsored by Core Trust Bank. Thank you Ron and welcome all to tonight's Minnehaha County Historical Society's monthly history talk brought to you via YouTube's live stream service. My name is Rick Langberg, and I'm Vice President of the Minnehaha County Historical Society, and I'll be your live stream host this evening. Before I turn this over to Will, I'd like to remind you that on the right of your screen, you will see a chat box from which you are welcome to interact with each other. And if you have a question for Will, we'll entertain those questions as we go along. In 1975, at the age of 22, I moved to Sioux Falls. At that time, Sioux Falls offered many nighttime opportunities, which include the Fireside Lounge in the Western Mall and a plethora of downtown hotspots to include the Macamba Club, Earl's Bar, the Rainbow Bar, the Frontier Club, and the subject of tonight's presentation, the Pomp Room. 
The pomp room never let me down for the opportunities a young single man who was searching for a good time, cold beer, good looking ladies, and great music. One of the bands that frequently played in my days at the pomp room was Choosy Music, led by tonight's speaker, Will Prines, and his wife, Vesta. I'll let Will tell you more about Choosy Music. That's his story. Will has been a composer, performer, arranger, and producer of music for many years. He started with seven years of classical piano instruction as a child. He would eventually get into what he calls the hard knock world of professional music and ultimately would play with the likes of Neil Diamond, Patti LaBelle, Little Anthony, Frankie Lyman and the ad libs, as well as performing with a Las Vegas favorite comedian and television star, Jerry Van Dyke and many others. With a desire to get off the road and raise a family, Will would go on to own Creative Communications Recording Studio in Sioux Falls for over 25 years. Today, he plays live dates in various musical style and is the leader of a contemporary music in his local church. Please join me in welcoming music performer, producer, and 2019 inductee into the South Dakota Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Pomp Room alumnus, Will Pry. Hey, Rick, thank you for that introduction. That's, um, gee, I guess I've done a couple of things. Hey, <laughs> basically, tonight we want to talk about the, this uh, place that has kind of become an icon in the Sioux Falls music scene, the Pomp Room. Um, first things first, people have said, where did that name come from, the Pomp Room? Well, actually, it was originally called the Pomp Room, but they kind of stole that from a place in Chicago called the Pump Room. It was in a hotel there. And uh, after getting a, uh, a letter saying, hey, knock it off, that's our name, uh, they decided to change it. And they, in order not to spend a lot of money changing signings, they just called it the Pump Room instead, which, you know, it was a, a good name. And uh, uh, and so it, it, forever it's been called the Pump Room. And um, uh, it, it was this, I think, this might be maybe the third location the one on Dakota Avenue. Um, basically, I, I think uh, uh, I could tell you a little bit about uh, the band. Um, Rick, could you put up that number five? Um, this is, uh, you've seen this picture already, but uh, the band was organized in Rapid City, um, Rapid City, South Dakota. That picture there, uh, it was taken up at Hangman's Hill. Uh, good friend of Vesta's was a photographer, a uh, really good photographer, by the way, uh, Jerry Smalley. And he took quite a few pictures of us, but this one just popped out because it was black and white and had a really interesting kind of background and stuff, and it was just composed well. And we ended up using this for an awful lot of promo stuff. Uh, but uh, Vesta and I were the ones that put this together, and then the next member was the guy right in the middle between the, uh, well, there's two of us there. He's kind of in the middle with a big goofy grin. <laughs> Tom Sitzler, he's, he's the smilingest guy I've ever known. Uh, he's just always in a good mood, and uh, he happened to be husband of a friend of Vesta's in Rapid City. Uh, he'd been playing drums for a long time, and we were looking for a drummer, and they just connected. Uh, and uh, originally, we went on the on the road with another band member who didn't quite work out, but we were doing more of a I got you, more of a lounge kind of a thing where we were doing songs uh, that were kind of uh, standards uh, and newer stuff, uh, Broadway musical things movie themes, that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, after a while, we kind of went, you know, there's there's a couple of different levels in, when you're traveling, when you're touring and stuff. And we were seeing all these other bands that were doing kind of uh, more rock and roll, more modern stuff, having younger crowds and whatnot. And we thought, you know, we should change, we should do that. Well, the guy on the right in that picture, Bob Stickle, was from um, Columbus, Ohio. But he and I had served in the military. Uh, he was in the Navy, I was in the Air Force, but we were stationed on the same base in Japan. And we had a band together there, doing mostly blues, mostly uh, the contemporary stuff at the time, though. Um, Creedence Clearwater and that kind of thing. Um, anyway, and, he, you know, I called him and he said, yeah, I'll play. So uh, he came out and we rehearsed and got that all together, went on the road and started playing a lot more rock and roll gigs. Um, and I think we were we were much happier that we made that change. But we were playing in uh, some, I can't remember exactly what it was, some kind of, business convention or something in Council Bluffs. 
Um, for those who are outside of our geographical area, Council Bluffs is right across the river from Omaha. So, uh, you know, we had a lot of people coming and going whatnot. But um, one of the people that came over to see us on a break uh, was a guy from here, from Sioux Falls. Uh, and he came up on a break and said, hey, um, I really like this band. Do uh, you guys ever consider playing in Sioux Falls? And we said, well, we're, you know, we're, we're living in Rapid City right now. Um, but, uh, yeah, Sioux Falls would be great. Um, we're, we're looking to get kind of get away from all the booking agents with that up and down kind of booking situation. Uh, we had probably, gosh, we had two agents in California, uh, one in Texas, uh, one in Minneapolis, one in Wisconsin, uh, one in Chicago, uh, one in Nebraska, and and but it was always a juggling thing. You never knew. Uh, you, I mean, you could book out a few weeks, maybe even a couple of months, but then there's always that time where. Nobody has something going on. So I thought, well, I need to probably start doing more of that myself. So that's what I was doing. And when Fred came along, by the way, uh, Rick, why don't you put up uh, that number six? This, uh, if you remember Fred, Fred's the guy on the left there. Um, and the guy on the right is actually Steve Henningsen from Kello's Big News. And I think uh, Fred was doing a weekend anchor or something at the time. This is a... This was a graphic that they had for a promo for a Keller radio show that they had. Uh, but Fred um, was uh, the son of the owners of the Pomp Room. Uh, and uh, he, he said, basically, you know, we've got kind of an old-timey uh, uh, kind of thing going on right now. And we want to get, um, you know, a little more modern music, younger crowd. And, uh, of course, the demographic was that's kind of where more money was, actually. Uh, so we said, sure, we'll come up and try that. And uh, we did go up there, and let's see. Oh, before we move, <laughs> actually, that was Fred back in 1974, 75, 70, somewhere around there. Anyway, uh, Rick, if you'd put up number 14, we got a, we got a picture of closer to Fred today. Uh, he's, he looks a little, little bit different, doesn't he? Uh, of course, some of us, you know, never age. We look no different than we did back then, of course. <laughs> no, Fred's a good guy, and, and uh, he's aged pretty well, actually. Uh, so anyway, if you would take us to um, number 12. Um, there we go. That's the place. <laughs> uh, I don't know when this actual picture, this picture was probably taken much later than uh, we played there. Uh, the Freeloaders were a band that were, you know, uh, quite a few years after we played. But um, this was the place. This was the, the iconic uh, club in town there. Uh, and uh, they really, it grew to as far as popularity. I don't know how it could have grown more as far as capacity of people being in that club, but it's it's it got known far and wide. And after a while, it got known by some of the national acts and people who were trying to break into being a national act and whatever. Uh, but this was the place that we played. And I, I I got a few songs that I want to do this evening. Just to, these are not all ones that we would have done with the band because back at that time, this would have been 1975, um, most of the stuff that we were doing was dance music because that was the thing. The thing for a band was to fill that dance floor. Uh, and if you could keep people dancing and playing the, the top songs that they liked, whatever, uh, then we had a good chance of having return engagement, which was what we're kind of looking for. Uh, but I'm doing some things now that are just a little bit more on the... the um, Maybe a little mellower than what we were doing. But I really can't sing uh, Sly and the Family Stones Dance to the Music by myself, you know, so I've got to kind of mellow it out a little bit here. Uh, but this is, uh, this is a song that, uh, that uh, we, uh, we had done in the past. And it was, um, I think originally, originally it was done by Cannonball Adderley, a jazz sax player, and uh, Joe Zavano. Joe Zavano was a keyboard player who played with... Uh, Oh, was it Weather, Weather Report, I believe? But anyway, he was an excellent player and uh, just an all-around talented guy. Uh, but the song is um, its called uh, Mercy, Mercy. My baby, she may not look Like one of those bunnies in the Playboy book But she got something that's greater than gold I'm crazy about that girl cause she got so much soul I got the kind of loving, kissing and hugging Sure is mellow, glad that I'm a feather And I know that she knocks me off my feet Have mercy on me, cause she knocks me off my feet 
Cause there is no girl in the whole world That can love me like you do well, My baby, when she walks by All the fellas go And I know why Well, she's so pretty, yes, yeah, she's so fine If she ever leave me, I would lose my mind Got the kind of loving, kissing and a hugging Sure is mellow, glad that I'm a fella And I know that she knocks me off my feet Have mercy on me, cause she knocks me off my feet And there is no girl in the whole world That could love me like you do Mercy, mercy, mercy <laughs> a, little, uh, a little blast out of the past I think the Buckinghams did that song about 1963 or something Anyway, um, that song was always kind of a crowd pleaser it wasn't, it wasn't a big dance tune, but it was kind of in between Say, Bill and I didn't want to Yes, sir. Yeah, this is Rick. We got a question out there. Uh, not everybody okay. knows where the uh, pomp room was at, so maybe give them an ah. idea where it was actually located. Okay. Uh, well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you put up number 15? This street, you can see the pomp room bar is on the left. This is Dakota Avenue, uh, and I believe that's right off of... Um, uh, that, that's right off of 8th Street, I believe, isn't it? Um, this, these buildings here on, on the right, where uh, there's a white kind of brick building, the one next to it says Farm and Home. Those buildings weren't there, I believe, when we played there. This, this picture was taken probably in the 1968, 1969, something like that. I mean, I see a couple of cars that could have been 67, 68, 69. Maybe it was. Um, but this is, this is Dakota, just north of uh, 8th Street. Right here where this white building is on the right and that farm and home building, the public library is over there now, and it's been there for quite a while. Um, so that's where the physically where the pomp room bar was located. Uh, and um, it's, it's it's kind of interesting that uh, they, they had been in two, I think two other locations before that, but they were in this location kind of un until the end of their run, you know. I think the location where the pomp room it was is now a um, parking garage. Excuse me. Um, uh, could you put up number three, Rick? Here's the two people that owned the pomp room, Dwayne and Jeannie Ertz. Uh, I think this picture was taken a little bit after we had played there because Dwayne looks like he's just a little bit heavier than I remembered when we played there. But Jeannie looked the same. She just looked fabulous all the time. She was trim. She had just jet black hair, always had a smile for everybody, and uh, just they were just great people. Um, Jeannie had a temper. <laughs> you didn't want, didn't want to get her mad, <laughs> but, but they were generally the, just really good people, and uh, we just enjoyed working with them so much. I remember the um, when we first moved in, first kind of started moving our equipment in there the first time we were playing there, there was no stage. Well, I take that back. There was one of these little tiny corner stages the kind they used to have that you know today you couldn't fit you couldn't even fit my keyboard on a stage like that uh i don't know what they did back then but you couldn't fit a drum kit on there and and we come in and we looked at that and we said you know that's that's not going to work for us so we talked to Dwayne and we said look um if you buy the materials we'll build the stage for you and uh and he agreed to it so we went over to shoneman's lumber at the time and uh you know, got plywood and two by fours and all that kind of stuff. And we came back and, uh, set, and this was on a this was on a Monday morning. <clears throat> we uh, built the stage, and then moved the equipment in in the afternoon <laughs> and played that night. So that was a full day's work. Uh, we just built the the, uh, the frame of it, and it was still hollow underneath. So somebody later on had gone in and filled that in underneath with some kind of sound, you know, absorbing material. Uh, but it worked, you know, for the first several times we played there, um, and uh, it was it was pretty interesting. That stage was still there, like I don't know, seven or eight years later, after we had changed members of the band and stuff and came back again, uh, it was still there. I, I think it was kind of the same one. 
after that, um, I think it was when Johnny Ertz, um, Fred's younger brother, uh, I think when he took over, then he kind of changed the stage to the size of it and all that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, we could fit. We we I think our stage ended up being maybe twelve by twenty four, or maybe it was sixteen by twenty four. I don't remember. We didn't do a whole lot of cutting of those, uh, you know, um, eight foot you know plywood boards. Um, but it was uh, it was sturdy. And it held us, and we used some extra carpet that Dwayne had back in the storeroom from the, the carpet on the floor, same pattern stuff, carpet the front and around the sides of it, uh, and on top of the stage as well, so we could, wouldn't have be uh, clomping around there, you know. Uh, and it was, a, it was kind of fun. I mean, it kind of, we felt like we were part of the family, kind of <laughs> helping out and, you know, build a place or whatever. Um, but I remember when we played, there was another band that um, – played around the same time most of the time it was you know them or us or whatever but uh, rod jerky had a band called priceless which turned into um i think it might have been power play or it might have been um i think it was uh, uh there's another band name they had in there but um rod is the guy that had uh, hot rod chevy kevy uh and, and that band still uh, i played with them a couple of times here just some some um Oh, oh, well, last time was a couple of years ago. It was like a firehouse kind of deal, you know. Um, and uh, anyway, it was a fun dance, and uh, they always they always get it going, you know. So, uh, But we were kind of trading off with them. Uh, and uh, uh, at some point in there, Dwayne and Jeannie asked if we would be the house band. And that meant we didn't have to move gear. You know, we weren't going to go play in, you know, this here this week and there next week and whatever. Uh, we just set up and we stayed there until they said, we want to change. And we were there for, I don't know, a little over six months, you know, as being the band at the Pomp Room. Um, and we kept learning new material. When we were on the road, we learned, oh, my goodness. Um, we tried to keep up because music was changing so fast. It, you know, the, the top 40 stuff that we were playing, the dance music part of top 40, uh, was added to every week, and we had new songs all the time. So we were earning, we were learning five or six songs a week. Um, usually, we'd learn one a day, you know, from Monday through Saturday. Um, and uh, we kind of kept an eye on what was being played on the jukebox, so we could play the popular stuff, and also what was on top of the Billboard charts, so we could do that. Um, and I think, uh, let's see, if we got. Um, yeah, Rick, put up number seven, if you would. This will show a little bit of that stage, even though this this is, um, yeah, <laughs> you can see the carpet and everything. And uh, Well, you can't see the carpet because the dance floor is right there. But this was uh, my end of the stage, the keyboard end. Well, Investa was there most uh, a lot of the time, too, because we, were, we carried around, I carried around, um, the Hammond B3 organ with the Leslie you can see here on the left, it's got it's got the choosy music heart logo thing up there, um, so we carried around the Hammond B3 and a Leslie. Uh, you see, I'm sitting there at the piano, which was, I believe, we started out with a spinet piano, and then we went to a console piano size. On top of that, it looks like is a Farfisa electric piano, and over here, I can't really, I can't make out. I think it's a harp string ensemble. But at one time, I had like seven keyboards because it was it's it wasn't like today where you can have one keyboard that does a, a zillion different sounds this keyboard that i'm sitting in front of here has got hundreds of sounds on board sampled sounds uh so you can get everything you'd want just from this keyboard back then you couldn't do that if you wanted to get an organ sound <laughs> you had to have an organ if you wanted a piano sound you had to have a piano uh and uh, we were we were kind of fortunate to, to discover the string ensemble instrument that was made by a company called arp um and it gave you the strings for some of the ballads and stuff that we did. Plus, I had a couple of synthesizers and um, a thing called a clavinet, which was kind of a... Well, if you listen to Superstition by Stevie Wonder, you can hear that. That's the clavinet that does that. It's kind of a piano-type keyboard that has um, has this plucked kind of string sound. Uh, and it was, it was very popular in a lot of songs, especially dance songs. So we used to carry all that stuff around, plus the PA system, plus the stuff for the guitars and drums and all that kind of thing. And it was, um, uh, you had to have a pretty, pretty strong back to do that st Strong back, weak mind, you know, whatever <laughs> the case may be. Um, uh, in, uh, Rick, if you put up number nine, um, there's a, 
I, th I think this was in the introduction, but this kind of this is kind of how things were most nights at the pomp room. Now, this was probably much later than when we played there, but it was the same idea. There were so many people that would show up. It was so crowded all the time. Um, and it was just, it was one of those things where you'd wonder, how can they pack this many people in here? But they did. And it was every night of the week was kind of like that. Monday night would start off slower, um, but it would end up being more like this. And as, as the week went on, it would kind of fill up earlier. Um, and, you know, there's, um, I think Vesta has a comment about um, kind of the situation and, and what uh, a couple of the issues that it, uh, it brought up. You want to roll that, Rick? What a place the Pompera was. With uh, our traveling band in the 70s, we were in many different types of clubs across the country, and none even came close to having the personality of the Pomp Room. It had a very distinctive aura, and it had a very distinctive odor. Especially in the afternoons, it would be really cold, and the place would just reek of cigarette smoke and body sweat and booze. And I have never since been in any place that would pack that many people in an area. I know there was many a night when we'd take a break, and if you had to go to the bathroom, you were just out of luck because there was no way it would happen. The bathroom wasn't really that far from the stage, but there was no way a body could walk through that wall of people, wait in line, do your thing, walk back through that wall of people in a 15-minute time span. And now all these years later, I often wonder, where in the heck was the fire marshal? <laughs> Yeah, we thought about that often when we were there. It was one of those things where, you know, you don't really, you don't really think about it when you're having fun, having a good time, and there's a big crowd. But the whole thing was, you know, the whole idea: where, what if there's a fire? What would happen? Well, we would have had a whole bunch of people packed up on the stairway, or you know, whatever, because it was just really, really crowded. And the other thing was, uh, it was the kind of thing where, um, uh. Well, back then, you could st everybody could still smoke in a, in a club or a bar or whatever. Um, and <laughs> I think everybody that was in there was smoking two cigarettes or three at a time. It was always, always, always heavily smoky. I mean, it looked like London fog in the place. And they had these big machines on the ceiling that were supposed to clean the air, turn it over, whatever, you know, vent it outside. They, they couldn't keep up, not at all. So... Every time we'd, you know, play there, we'd come away from there, just everything, everything was just reeking uh, of cigarette smoke. And then, of course, the other, <laughs> the other odors that Vesta mentioned there. Uh, yeah, it, it had a, it had an odor that, um, uh, you know, you could walk in there, uh, you know, 50 years after you'd been there and you'd still reckon, oh, yeah, this is the bomb room, you know, <laughs> just the way it was. It was, uh, it was the, uh, um, yeah, uh, people affectionately called it a dive bar, you know, which it kind of sort of was. Um, it wasn't like the pump room in Chicago, you know, the hotel kind of uh, bar. Uh, but it was just a place, you know, that everybody went to just have some fun, listen to some good music, have some f have some um, booze and, and bar snack kind of things and, and maybe meet uh, a young lady or young man, whatever the case might have been. And, and uh, it was just a fun place. And um, that fun was contagious because it caught on and people just uh, flocked to there, you know. And I know there were other places, like Rick mentioned earlier, you know, the Fireside and all the others. Uh, but they didn't have the same cachet. It was just a little different. This was kind of a, that, you know, uh, not-so-secret place, but it was just a cool place to go. Say, uh, we say felt well. privileged to play there. So. Say yes, well. sir. Yeah, here's a question. How did how did you plan out a night? I mean, what was the order of events? Was there an order of events? And how did uh, it? What time did you start? And how did could, how did it progress? And when did when would you stop? Well, well, I guess um, the uh, each each night was a little different, but every night we started at the same time. We started at nine o'clock, and we played until one thirty in the morning, and that was pretty standard back then. Um, and we'd play. Um, well, sometimes we'd play 45 minutes and take 15 minutes break. 
uh, more often than not would play 50 or 55 minutes and take 20 minutes or something, you know. Uh, but it would end up so that at the, at the end of the night, we'd end up at 1.30. Um, a lot of nights, a lot of nights would have that, one more song, one more song, you know. So we'd end up playing overtime until Dwayne McMillan would say, hey, I'm going to shut off the power here if you don't quit playing. Um, and that would happen a lot just because we enjoyed playing and, and people wanted to hear one more song. Well, you know, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> many people, after they had too many drinks, they want one more song, one more song. Yeah, and we tried to, you know, make people, keep people happy and stuff, keep them coming back. But, uh, yeah, one one thirty was usually the cutoff time because uh, they, by law, I think they had to, you know, lock the place up at 2 o'clock. Uh, and they had to still get places clean and stuff like that. And, uh, uh, Rick, that... Um, um, that the picture was in there in Vesta's talk. That number ten, and you can put that up again. That's that kind of shows what it, the end of a kind of a typical night. Um, <laughs> it's just that was <coughs> that I believe was the uh, the back bar. <laughs> so that wasn't even the main main bar. That was the that was the back bar upstairs, um, and the main bar was downstairs. And there was another bar off to the side. And I think there were there were several bars in the place. And by the end of the night, it was it was like that. It was just totally cluttered and crowded. Um, but then the other thing too was, as I mentioned, you know, we get to the end of the night and, um, uh, you, you know, you, when you left, you'd have to go, uh, immediately just go home and shower and stuff and, you know, throw the clothes into the, into the wash because, uh, the smoke was just really, you know, and everything, the equipment too. There's one other thing in this same vein. Um, let's see, where is the, the, I got a, uh, Okay, yeah. Uh, number one, Rick. Um, this was a this was a, another incarnation of the band that that happened later on. This was actually the band that we had. Um, we play, the first band, Choosy Music, played from like seventy five to seventy eight. This band played from like nineteen eighty to maybe eighty two, that kind of thing. But this was uh, we had the same drummer, uh, Tom Sitzler, and of course Vesta's there in the yellow. I'm way over there, kind of behind. At the, at the keyboard corner, <laughs> and then in the middle was a guy named Gary Brockmeyer, who was an excellent blues guitar player and singer. Uh, and then uh, on this uh, left side was Butch Zirath. Butch played bass, and he played with a whole lot of different bands. <clears throat> Excuse me, in that time period, he was just really good, and uh, everybody wanted to have him play. And he ended up uh, playing, uh, gosh, I don't know how many bands over, you know, about a, a ten or fifteen year period there. But uh, when we got inducted into the South Dakota. Music Association Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Butch was with us as one of our band members to get uh, inducted at the same time. Well, the same night, Butch got inducted into I think three bands <laughs> at, with three bands all together that night. Uh, he was he was really active in the Sioux Falls music scene back at the time, uh, and uh, of course he's been up in the cities now for well, a lot of years. Um, anyway, uh, he did he did manage to get back for that uh, rock and roll. Uh, awards thing, which was kind of nice. Um, and uh, let's see. Basically, there's a couple of things that we... Um, oh, I got to got to show you this. One of the things that we... <clears throat> excuse me. We were kind of considered a show band back then. Because we did, you know... Um, we, we had, you know, uh, different kinds of uh, outfits and stuff that we wore that were, you know, definitely not what you'd wear on the street. Um, the, you know, the guys, um, we got... A lot of our stuff from a company called Flag Brothers. Um, Flag Brothers used to be clothing and shoes. I remember growing up in Pittsburgh, downtown, they had a Flag Brothers that was uh, mostly, it was like black fashions, you know, black shoes, whatever. Black folks, um, you know, and they were, they were great, but they were just uh, something that was kind of showy. You'd, you wouldn't use it in regular, you know, daily life. Uh, and Vesta stuff... Um, she used to buy her outfits from a place called Fredericks of Hollywood that was, um, oh, I don't know, they, a lot of people in the entertainment industry and um, I, I think other industries probably, you know, bought their outfits from there. It was kind of, kind of different. They were all very, um, oh, I don't know, uh, elegant, glamorous, whatever the term would be. Um, but uh, they were, they, again, there's something you probably would not wear just to, you know, out and about, whatever. Uh, maybe to a you know a party or something, but they were uh, they were generally uh, nice outfits and they were showy, and so we also played multiple instruments back then. Um, uh, let me see, uh, Rick, if you could show number eleven. <clears throat> 
one of the this is one of the this is Vesta playing the, the trumpet. Um, she and I both uh, picked up playing trumpet. Uh, and I also picked up uh, alto and tenor sax so that we could do a lot of the dance stuff where we were, um, you know, playing a horn and maybe carrying a, a line on the keyboard with our left hand and, and then singing, you know, harmony parts and whatnot. Um, that was part of the whole show band thing about playing a couple of different instruments. Occasionally you go out and do some dance steps and stuff like that, you know. Uh, might have a little, depending on the kind of night it was, you might have a little patter back and forth and, you know, jokes or whatever. Uh, it was. It wasn't really like a Las Vegas thing, but it was just the whole idea was to put on more of a show rather than just play tune after tune. But when the dancing started, you really had to keep playing tune after tune. So we were kind of a cross between the show band and the dance band. Uh, but you can see, uh, uh, like I said, she's. Uh, I don't know what song she's playing there, but um, most of the time, I wish I had another shot of you know, how we used to do the uh, on the on the Hammond organ. If you go back to that. Um, uh, the keyboard corner shot that we had, uh, number seven. Maybe you can see kind of where we're where we're at. Yeah, uh, you see where Vesta's standing up. What she's doing there, she's playing um, with her left hand. Left hand, she's playing a bass line, and with her right hand, she's playing um, either the strings or a synthesizer line, or maybe just a, a an organ patch, kind of a just playing a rhythm part behind it. And I'm I'm probably playing more of a uh, a lead and rhythm mixture on the on the piano, uh, but because for quite a while there we didn't actually have a bass player, she or I would play bass left hand on a synthesizer, um, and it was you know it wasn't wasn't a bass guitar by any means, but it was uh, it was down in that range and it it, it um, keyboard keyboard bass was uh, it came a long way after that but uh, remember the Doors that's uh, they used to play keyboard bass um, and um, you know, in a concert situation, when you have sound reinforcement, you you know, it's hard to tell that what the bass is. It's just it's down there in that frequency and it's moving to where it needs to be, and and so it filled in when we didn't actually have the bass player. Um, so anyway, that was all part of being a show band, that whole thing, um, and uh, and I think um, uh, we kind of uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we kind of crossed that line quite a bit between those but you know with bands that used to come into town that would play like the Macama club uh they were kind of the, they were kind of show bands too but they were doing a little more higher level show band stuff than what we were doing uh, i mean they were actually out front doing steps and whatnot and you know and we didn't do much of that um but anyway it was uh, it was a, a very interesting thing but we mostly we wanted to play what people wanted to hear um and <clears throat> one of the other things too is um uh, as we were playing oh no i gotta tell you this i gotta tell you this thing we were talking about the smoke. Okay, uh, go back to picture number one, Rick. The, you know the thing, like I said, those um, uh, air move movers were not just not working at all. Uh, you can see that set of drums that's right there. That's uh, when we when we started playing at the Pomp Room. Uh, Tom bought that set of Rogers drums. I'll get granted, this is after having played in a lot of bars for a lot of years, because this is now in the early 80s. When we went in there in 1975, he had a brand new set of white pearl drums. When we got through playing that six months of being in the club, that white pearl turned yellow. <laughs> I mean, you can see the yellow finish. It was much more yellow in person. <laughs> this this picture is a little washed out for color. But it wasn't as yellow as Vesta's dress there, but it was it was yellow. So... And I just keep thinking, over the years, yeah, we inhaled all that stuff. We didn't have to actually be smoking. You know, we got that in our lungs anyway. But, uh, oh, well, it's uh, so far, everybody, well, I should say, that's, we, uh, we didn't suffer a lot from it. Um, so, anyhow, let's go to a picture here of, um, oh, number two. <laughs> we played... We played for a lot of different seasons and holidays and stuff down there. This was one of the. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what everybody's supposed to be in there, but uh, it was just. We all we dressed up for Halloween every time Halloween came around. We were playing there, you know, yeah, try to have a good time. And uh, uh, anyway, it was kind of interesting. But that I think that leads me, <clears throat> excuse me, to an, another song here that uh, one was done by the Classics for, and also. Um, uh, 
Well, it was it was a hit a couple of times. Let's just put it that way. Um, hmm. <laughs> Everything is getting kind of grueling. I call you up and ask you if you want to go with me and see a movie. Well, first you say no, you got some plans for the night, but then you stop saying, All right, love is kind of crazy with a spooky little girl like you. You always keep me guessing, never seem to know what you are thinking. But if a fella looks at you, down your little eye will be awakening. But I get confused, cause I don't know where I stand. And then you smile and hold my hand. Love is kind of crazy with a spooky little girl like you. This little game that you were playing I'm gonna tell you the only thing My heart's been dying to be saying Just like a ghost You've been haunting my dreams So I propose On Halloween Love is kind of crazy With a spooky little girl like you a Spooky, yeah That's a fun tune too. That was um uh say well here's another question. Is was this okay. something you guys were doing were these full time jobs or you know, how did this all fit into your life? Oh yeah, we when we were on the road it was full time. Um we, you know, you're you're in a place where you know, sometimes just for a few nights in the, on the weekend, sometimes it was a full night if it was a club gig. Um and um so yeah, we were on the road. See, I got out of the I got out of the service in 1970, um, and um, put together a band and went on the road there from 1970. Uh, so the band broke up in 1973, and that's when I, I met Vesta, and um, and then we put together this band, took that on the road, and we played till. Well, it, actually, it turns out that, that I was on the road for seven years, um, living out of a suitcase, basically, you know. Uh, and Vesta was with me for four of those years. Um, but, um, yeah, it was a full-time job. Um, you know, you could, yeah, it's not like today where you can do remote work, you know, whatever. Back then, you had to show up for, you know, wherever you were working. And, um, and we were all over the country. We toured um, 15 or 16 states. And... Um, uh, like I said, we had all these booking agents that would put us all over the place. The routing was one thing that we, we had difficulty with because I remember one year, um, I'm not sure, I think it might have been 74, it was during the gas shortage where uh, you could only buy so many gallons. The lines were really long for gas. The gas stations were closing on Sundays just all, all over the country. And, uh, of course, Sunday was the only day that we had to travel for the most part. If we were playing in a club, we were there from Monday through Saturday night, and then we'd have to pack up, hit the road, drive all day Sunday to get to where we were going to play to start Monday. Um, and uh, so you can see that would have, you know, the, the gas shortage and the gas station closings were kind of difficult. There were a few times where, you know, we'd kind of creep into in the town because we're almost out of gas and park next to a gas station and have to wait until it opened up in the morning in order to to uh, continue our journey, uh, some of the some of the dates we had to say no, we can't do. We uh, one weekend we were supposed to close Saturday night in Rapid City. There's a cool cool club out there called the Embers Club. It was a really hot place to go. And uh, anyway, we, we we were supposed to finish there on a Saturday night, 
and they wanted us to open Monday night in Fort Lauderdale. This is during the gas shortage. How are we going to drive <laughs> from Sioux Falls, South Dakota to Fort Lauderdale, Florida over Sunday and part of Monday? I just, it w- wasn't going to work. So we said, no, we're not going to do that one. And I think the only other one we actually turned down in that time period is we were supposed to go to um, Virgin Islands. Um, they were going to fly all of our gear. They're going to fly us down there. I mean, they're going to fly the, the Hammond organ and the piano and all that stuff. <clears throat> but that meant that we were going to be at St. Croix during the middle of hurricane season. And um, I'm allergic to big amounts of water and that kind of high wind stuff. You know, So we said no to that one, too. But most of the other ones, <clears throat> we would drive, you know, uh, 12, 15 hours to get from one gig to the next. And it was um, long, long haul. And um, we take turns driving, of course. Um, at least Justin and I did. The other guys had, we had three vans all together that we fit everything in. <clears throat> so, well, we got a, a question from the chat box here. Uh, do you know how many years the pomp room was there? And do you know when it closed? <clears throat> you know, I think um, the pomp room was net location from, uh, I think, 74, maybe. And I think they closed in 92. Uh, I'm not sure of that exactly, but I kind of remember it was in the early 90s somewhere. Um, but they had a good long run. You know, and I mean, after we played there, I mean, uh, you know, uh, our band and Rod's band and a few others have played there. Then they started, um, <clears throat> they started getting some of the bigger nationally known acts in there. Um, I mean, they have people like, uh, well, here, uh, there's number, um, number eight. We put that one up. I think that was when Aerosmith uh, showed up. Yeah, uh, Aerosmith showed up and they had um, camera crew from MTV. They were doing a special on, uh, you know, local places that had entertainment and uh, they heard about the pomp room and and uh, brought in the camera crew and they they shot that while they were there. and this is this is 93 so it was after that that the place closed so it might have been i don't know 95 96 um but i don't i don't remember because I, I was really not that involved in the place at the time I mean, we would go there occasionally but um uh, so we know it's after after 93 <laughs> the slide <clears throat> excuse me uh, but some of the bands that played there, I mean, Aerosmith played there, but then some bands actually were booked in there, like Cheap Trick and um, Fugazi. And I remember John Kay, uh, who, who had Steppenwolf back in the day, kind of put together a new ensemble doing all those Steppenwolf tunes and whatnot. I can't remember what the name of the band was, but he played there. Uh, and there were quite a few. And they also had a lot of the um, more well-known, you know, local and regional bands, too. I mean, Wakefield played there, and Janitor Bob played there, and, and uh, the... Um, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, anyway, quite a few, and it, it was it was kind of like the place to play. Um, so uh, I guess. Um, oh yeah, I got to tell you one other story. Uh, put up number sixteen, if you would. Oh yeah, the the guy in the center there, the white and blue shirt there. That's Johnny Ertz. <clears throat> he was. Uh, he was uh, taking care of the place. Uh, uh, I think it was uh, Wade uh, did first, and then Johnny did after Dwayne and Jeannie kind of phased out. But this is just kind of symbolic. I mean, I don't know whose bike that was, if it was his or not. But this reminds me of a story that um, when we, it was one of the first times we played there. Cause we played like, you know, off and on there for quite a few years. And um, there was a there was a, a band back in the, that time period called War. And uh, they had a song that was, That's it. Anyway, it was um, called Low Rider. Well, we got to the pump room one night, and uh, the whole street in front of the pump room, from corner to corner, was all motorcycles. And they were parked kind of like this, so they were on a... It wasn't like parked like a car would park. They were parked face, face in, kind of a deal. And they were just... Dozens and dozens of motorcycles. And so we were going, ooh, okay, what's this going to bring <laughs> tonight? So we got in there, and it turns out there were two motorcycle gangs who were well represented. One was on one side of the club, and the other was on the other side of the club. And it's like nobody was coming together in the middle, you know? Uh, and so we thought, okay, I don't know if there was a full moon that night or not, because people do act kind of weird during a full moon. I don't know why that is. But people either get really quiet 
and sit on their hands, you know, or they get really manic, really active, you know. And I can't remember what this night was like, but I remember we were very cautious because we didn't know anything about these two groups. Uh, so anyway, we're up there playing, and, and we uh, uh, get through with one song, and a guy comes up in his colors, you know, and his patches and all that kind of stuff, and he's, uh, he's well, what songs do you play? <laughs> you know, and, well, we can't recite the whole song list, you know. I said, well, what kind of song would you like to hear, you know? And, uh, and he said, there's this song by War, was the name of the band that did, you know, The Low Rider, that little melody that I played for you. Uh, and uh, we said, yeah, we can do that one. Sure. Yeah, why not? Well, this melodica that I played for you, it's like a, it's like a keyboard harmonica. And Vesta played that as far as the melody goes. And then we, and the song is just, it's just a boom, 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 boom. It's just, it's kind of repetitious. It just goes over and over and over. But they really like, he really liked that song. And uh, we said, sure, we can play it. So we play that. And then the next set, hey, play that low rider song again. Well, we were kind of going, wait a second, we got these two motorcycle gangs in here. Uh, we don't want to cause any problems or have anything, you know, erupt or whatever. So we sure, we'll play it again. So we played it. So every every set that night, we had to play Lowrider. And then the next few weeks, whenever he can, he came in, he's going, Lowrider! You know, so, yeah, okay, we'll play it, you know. So it was kind of interesting. We never did any trouble from him. And I, as far as I know, they never had any kind of a rumble or whatever in the place or outside or whatever. They just kind of maintained. Uh, but we just, you know, didn't want to, <laughs> do anything to cause anybody to get uh, upset with us or uh, with the club or whatever, you know. Um, so anyway, listen, um, I think I've got, um, I've got one more song here that I'd like to do. And I, I, I think it's probably, I've kind of, um, <laughs> I've kind of <laughs> talked uh, enough here tonight, I think. Um, Rick, is there any other questions that we need to look at? No, we just want to hear your song. Okay, yeah. sounds good. This is a song that, um, interestingly enough, um, change the sound on this a little bit. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, it was a song that was offered to Tony Bennett. Uh, this has been back in the this was back in the early to mid '60s. Uh, and they said, "Here, here's a great song. You know, it's a good feel good kind of thing. You know, uh, we'd like you to do it." He kind of listened to the song and kind of said, "You know, that's not really." my style I, I don't really want to do that and so they had offered the song to a couple of other people and then they finally offered it to louis armstrong and louis armstrong liked it and he said yeah i'll do that song so he recorded it and it just became this huge hit worldwide it's it's what a wonderful world and i i often wonder if you know if tony better thought about that you know later on and he went boy i kind of made a mistake there didn't i <laughs> anyway so this is uh, this is the song what a wonderful world
Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rick, for inviting me for this, and thank you, everyone, who's uh, kind of watched and listened. And I also want to say a thank you to Jesse Yost, who provided a few of these uh, photos. Um, uh, Jesse and uh, some of his crew are doing a, an actual documentary on the Pomp Room. And I don't know how far along they are, but they've been working on this for a few years. And I know that they had interviewed Vesta and I and a whole lot of other people that played there and that worked there and that went there. So that might be an interesting interesting thing to look out for. I think right now you could probably find part of it just at pomproomdocumentary.com, I think. But if you search for Pomp Room, I'm sure you'll find it. Anyway, well, thank you very much. This has been a lot of fun to do, and I, I hope you all enjoyed it. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Will. We certainly did enjoy it. Brings back a lot of great memories. Uh, we had a tremendous crowd here tonight, so uh, a lot of people uh, wanted to uh, remember those days back at the Pompro. I know I, I certainly did, and, uh, and we really enjoyed uh, your stories, and we enjoyed your music and uh, very much appreciate it. So on behalf of the Minnehaha County Historical Society and everybody that was here tonight, uh, we thank you for uh, everything you did. We really appreciate it. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that uh, in another month, uh, on February 18th, we're going to have another live streaming. In fact, our next three historic uh, history talks are going to be live stream uh, in uh, February, uh, March, and April. The next one will be uh, presented by our own, one of our own board members, Jim Carlson. Uh, on the influenza of the 1918 called Influenza Brings Death uh, to Local Doughboys. So we invite you all to come back. We thank you again for everybody coming here tonight and hope you had a good time. And, and thanks again. Good night. <laughs>